Welcome back for another live stream. This is Kathy Randall from Synapse Care Solution, and we are continuing on with our Monday live streams. It is May 15th, 2023, which means it is International Kangaroo Care Day. And today's presentation is about out of the box holding. So this is a, a group from San Jose, California, who decided to track not only skin to skin in the first week of life, but all types of swallowed holding in their NICU. They really wanted to bring down the time that it took to get babies from delivery to their first hold. One of the attendees at this presentation was Dr. Susan Luddington Ho. If you have read anything about skin to skin mother care in the NICU over the last four decades, then you will have then you will know this name. Dr. Luddington Ho was able to present some of her information alongside the commentary from the group. So it was really an honor to have her. And at the end of this, you will really love the Q&A time we had together. If you'd like to download the slides to follow along or any of the other references that we mentioned in this talk, go ahead and scan the QR code that we have here on the screen or in the show notes below, there should be a link that will take you there. So again, welcome and thank you for being here and I hope you enjoy this presentation. We are really excited about this and you can tell from the attendee list, even live today, people are really excited to hear more about what you guys are doing. I was so excited when I heard this presentation at Graven. And, and really I'm excited you guys are here. And so I'll let you introduce yourself and the team. And then you, I know you have some slides for us as well. Hi everyone. So I'm just really glad to be here. Thanks for inviting us, Kathy. I'm Malati, I'm one of the neonatologists. I work in Northern California, El Camino and Stanford. It's been great honor to be joining this group and I'm so excited to share our work. So we have our team member here and Arlene is our one of the nurse champions and leader of this great project. So she is going to present with me. And I think I saw Maggie is from our unit too. So she is joined and I'm not sure if anybody else from our unit is joined. And thank you for all you do. Uh, it's a fantastic place for us to share our project. And so the first slide I'm presenting, it's the perfect time to share the kangaroo care story. It's a kangaroo care day, National Kangaroo Care Day. And so this project is the quality improvement effort to improve or out of the box. We came up with this terminology because not only is promoting the skin to skin contact, it's as well as the swaddle hold. And I'll explain to you more about why we picked and what are the benefits of the swaddle hold. So it was done in a community level three NICU. So I'm a Stanford faculty. We work at the community El Camino hospital. So it's a community level three NICU. And these are all our co-authors can see there's a nurse educator and nurse nursing staff and neonatologists are part of this project and successful it turned out to be a great success and we are still working doing this project as a sustainable period so you can see our data so we don't have any conflict of disinterest or nothing to disclose so what are the learner objectives the conclusion of this activity, you're able to recognize the physiologic response to stress and how the skin to skin care as a stress reducing activity. And also you can recognize the importance of developing a standardized skin to skin care in every NICU. I know every unit is spending time to doing the skin to skin care, but it's unless if you track or unless you measure, so you don't know if you are doing it well or is there any area you want to improve. So that's the next thing we wanted to take home message from the, after this talk and also overcome some of the barriers. They learn the concept of out of the box and what are the benefits of it and new ways of tracking time. It's not only skin to skin, also the swaddle hold and we are tracking the reading time. So all those things by creating the flow sheet and the electronic health record. So this slide is a courtesy of Dr. Majors from Nationwide Hospital. So she showed us this slide in the Gravens Conference. So this is the great way of looking at this. So fetal development of onset of sensory system. So they start with this touch and vestibular is when the mom is walking and it's surrounded by the amniotic fluid. So they have this mobility and then the auditory function develops and then visual function. So all these things are disrupted by um, delivering early and having the NICU experiences, uh, doing multiple procedures and immobility, exposing to the atypical loud sound and atypical brightness. All these things contribute to this, their sensory sensation differences. 
So the little background, so infants in NICU exposed to many sources of stress, as you all know. For example, average infants in the NICU experience 10 painful procedures per day. The physiologic responses to stress as critical implications for short-term and long-term outcomes for infants in NICU. So this is the flow diagram. It's showing mammalians that is response to stress situation. So when we expose to this low stress environment, then hypothalamus is secreting this oxytocin hormone. Everybody says the love hormone, so it's, it's a good thing. But when, in contrast, when we have this exposed to the high stress environment, the hypothalamus is producing the first level response, activation of a sympathetic nervous system, fight and fight response, and also activate this as vagal, nerve. So the vagal nerves are two components. One is the dorsal motor nucleus, the other one is the ventral motor nucleus. Ventral motor nucleus is the very positive things for the babies to have. The dorsal motor is the unmyelinated vagus nerve. Whenever they stimulate the vagus nerve, then they have this apnea, Brady, disengagement, and hypotonia. So this is the expansion of this high stress response that would happen if there is a sympathetic nervous system stimulated, you have this epinephrine and norepinephrine release, which causes all this consequences of somatic growth inhibited and also neurodevelopmental abnormalities and poor growth and increased inflammatory markers and such as, which is not a great thing for the babies to have. So in context, response, the oxytocin is causing this myelin vagus um, stimulation. That's the nucleus ambiguous. It causes the myelinated vagus nerves to be stimulated. Then we add this all positive things. They have a better cues, better engagement with parents and feeding. And also there's no sign of reflux and improved enteral feeding tolerance, improved digestion and probably growth. <laughs> So how do we, what is the connection between this oxytocin and skin-to-skin -skin care? In animal models, the oxytocin is released in newborns when they're exposed to this tactile stimulation, warm temperature, and massage of the abdomen. All these things can be achieved by doing this skin-to-skin -skin care. When mom is holding or any parents is holding, so they have this skin-to-skin -skin contact, warm temperature, and then the massaging of the abdomen that actually causing them to stimulate, increase the oxytocin release. And studies found that 60 minutes of skin to skin resulted in increased salivary oxytocin levels in mothers, fathers, and infants too, and decreased the infant salivary cortisol level, which is the stress hormone, so which is also decreased by doing the skin to skin care. Another study showed every additional 10 minutes of skin to skin care, oxytocin increasing by 17%. So it's like very dose dependent response. So if you have this every additional 10 minutes, then your oxytocin level is increasing and which causes the benefit of oxytocin related, all the benefits that I showed in the previous slides. So in a summary, so it's got both infants and parents, they get these benefits. And so the infants, it's stability of temperature. They don't have this desaturation episodes and stabilizing the cardiorespiratory rhythms and improves their sleep cycles. And also it provides the anesthesia during painful procedure. And in Colombia, the country Colombia, where this kangaroo care was discovered, so the 20 year follow up study was done, they noticed that so infants in a skin to skin care group had a less aggressive drive and were less impulsive and hyperactive compared to the control group. So it's long lasting effect. It's not only stop in the infant's time period, it's even after 20 years down the road, it's a beneficial. For parents, and it's improved their bonding and helps stimulate maternal lactation, and it's better adaptation by the parents with respect to the birth of the premature infant. So how do we come up with the swaddle hold? Okay, so everybody knows skin to skin is great, and the swaddle hold is, this article was in a parent magazine, Arlene, our nurse champion, she actually showed me this, and science proves you can't hold your baby too much. There is no such thing as holding your babies, you're spoiling your babies by holding too much. So I wanted to look at the study to dive and then see what exactly they looked at it. So it was published in Current Biology in 2017 by Nationwide Children's Hospital Group, and they looked at this touch exposure and then infant brain. So they included 125 preterm and term infant, and basically they looked at their EEG and event-related potential and they come up with the conclusions that premature babies were more likely to have a reduced response to touch than full-term babies. 
and premature babies also who had an increased amount of gentle touch from their parents or caregivers actually they responded more strongly with gentle touch than the premature babies who were in touched or held so that's the conclusion of this paper is like it provide this preterm babies a positive supportive touch such as skin to skin or in swaddle hold by parents so another paper was published in 2013 by this nursing group. They looked at the holding practice on preterm infant development. They randomized to three groups. They did the skin to skin, blanket hold, and control group between 32 to 35 weeks and 25 weeks in each group. They enrolled less than a month old. And so mother recorded a time held daily. And they looked at the preterm behavior, infant behavior at 40 and 44 weeks. What they found was that the skin to skin care and blanket hold groups had more optimal scores than in control group in robust crying, which is a rose to vigorous crying and calming down. So with all proves that so any positive touch, it's a swaddle hold, a containment hold, or skin to skin is beneficial for the babies. So this is overall, uh, what are the positive things that we can achieve by a touch response? So somatic sensation is a critical to development of social and cognitive and motor demise. So also if any disruption of the somatic created with the ADHD and autism spectrum disorder, and painful procedures in the NICU are associated with the altered brain microstructure and their stress hormone levels are increased, which causes the poor cognitive, motor, and behavior neurodevelopment. And also, this, uh, this is a very interesting and unfortunate thing to hear. The surgical and the NICU procedures associated with the increased threshold to hot and cold. And also, they have this called this dysesthesia. The touch feels very painful for those babies when they're exposed to this surgical procedure without having any positive touch response uh, during that procedure. The conclusion of this background is the best practice is a kangaroo care. We have to be as soon as possible, for as long as possible, and as un uninterrupted as possible. So that's the take-home message we got after attending the Gravens Conference in 2019. Um, so this is the, the picture of our a nursing champion. So who we'll lead this project and so make this successful. So I will hand over this to Erlene. So she's going to describe how we implemented this, what are the barriers, and, and then I will come back and talk about our data. Erlene? As Malky said, I started the, we started this project after the Gravens Conference. We prioritized looking at things that we can improve in our environment for these high-risk infants. One of the takeaways I had from the Gravens Conference was a percentage that was given at, for one of the lectures. And when a baby is in mom, a baby is in contact with his mother 98% of the time. When you look at the percentages around the world, in Europe and in Stockholm, babies are in contact with their mothers 65% of the time. But when we look at the United States, we actually only average about 10% of the time. And that's in the best NICUs. For the most part, it's about 5% of the time. So that really hit me. And I looked at our unit with skin to skin. Yes, we're getting the babies out, but we still had some issues with how long they're out. And then another priority for starting this was we're actually in the process of a remodel and going to private rooms. And so our family involvement and family skin to skin and family holding is going to be more, more important as we move into these private rooms. So we formed our group, as she showed you in the beginning, so with doctors, nurses, and we came up with two goals. Our first goal was to provide skin to skin for all infants less than 35 weeks within the first 48 hours of life. We were actually doing a pretty good job with that, but what we were missing was our micro preemies. And so we pulled up a lot of literature and looked at that and we wanted to improve and make sure that our micro preemies that have lines and humidity and all that were also being held in the first 48 hours to get those benefits. And then we also wanted to improve the time that our grower, as we call grower feeders are being held. And we wanted to improve that by 20%. So how did we do it? Go ahead. So some of the things we needed to do is we needed a way to tra track it. So we worked with IT department and we set up our electronic health record to have a tab in Epic that is, we call the tab our family center care tab. 
On that tab, we have when the doctors talk with the families, when the families come in and provide care, there's a way to chart that. There's the vocal part of it, so we can track our talking, our reading, our singing. And then, of course, we added the skin-to-skin -skin and swaddle holding section. That was important to get that started. The next thing I had to look at is how was I going to educate the staff? I mean, that's definitely a hard do when you're on a budget. So we came up with a display board and then we had a sign off sheet where the, everybody had to sign that they looked at the board. On it, we had information about what are the positive effects. We had on there what percentage we were at, which we were actually higher than the 10%. So we were excited where we started in our baseline. We also had to look at how we were gonna prioritize how we were gonna get these micro preemies out. We wanted to standardize it. So we were all doing the same thing. We all knew our roles. So our team, Michelle and I, got together with the RT department and we mocked it out. We got a doll and we pretended it had all its lines in it and a ventilator and we started role playing it till we found a way to keep the baby's head midline and transfer it to mom and in a midline position hold. And then once we did that, that was on the board and it showed pictures, but we were fortunate enough also to have skills day right afterwards. So we were able to also in skills day, demonstrate it to the nurses. And then right after we started this program, we were fortunate that we had a slew of micro preemies that came into our unit. And Malfi, a little bit later, we'll show you the data on how well we did with those. We needed to develop a parent handout. This is a handout that we give to our families when they first come in, that explains the importance of skin to skin because we all know that our parents are frightened. They feel their babies are very fragile and that they're gonna break. Um, and so we tried to have them read this so that they feel a little bit more comfortable before they come in for their first skin. We're currently working also in getting it in a Spanish version since we have a big Spanish population. And then along with this, we wanted a, a gift certificate to show that that first held was done. I noticed the first month I wasn't seeing a lot of these certificates up at the bedsides, even though the data was showing that the babies were being held. So what I did is I actually just sent an email out to the doctors and had them become champions. There's less of them and it's easier for me to reach them and have them be champions. So they became champions reminding the nurses at the bedside to get from these from the file cabinet and hand them to the families and then put up the certificate once the held was done. Another way I did it is just my champions in my unit. When we notice a new baby comes into the unit, I'll just go put the papers at the bedside or Michelle will put the papers at the bedside as a reminder to that nurse that we want the baby held in the first 48 hours. So this is just a diagram again showing that process from A to D that I've been talking about. But the biggest takeaways I can say is that it has made us successful in this program is partnering with leadership, going in, meeting with leadership, letting them know what your plans are, they, we might be surprised. There might be some budget hidden somewhere that can help support this. If there's no budget, recruit champions that just believe in it. One of my co cohorts in this, Michelle, she's had preemies in the NICU herself. So she's a big cohort for promoting this program because she, she knows how important it was with her girls. Working with IT department, there's maybe a champion in there that can help you in setting up the flow sheets. And then if you're limited budget or no budget, another way, like at our hospital, if you're a CM3, you have to belong with projects and you have to work on projects. So pulling in those people as your resources to help you start the project. And then another important thing is just look outside your unit. Look at your hospital. Are there hospital committees? Is there a family committee at your hospital? Do they have protocols already written to help you with this? And then your volunteers, there's volunteer committees. Maybe they can help make display items for you at home and then you pick them up. Another thing I would say is just looking outside your unit. Um, so we're gonna go back to Malfi and she'll go over some of the data we found. So this is a slide that we did the graven stock this uh, year. So yeah. So as Arlene mentioned, so we have this electronic health record, flow sheets. And so the nurses are documenting. As you see, this is in a range of the minutes documentation. So when we are collecting the data, we needed to know the actual minutes. So it 
came up with this idea of like if there is a range so i picked some middle number so if they spent 0 to 15 minutes for holding then i come up with this 10 minutes is the average arbitrarily picked some number for each range so then we added all the minutes per day for the baby for their entire stay and divide that probably the average minutes per day for that baby during their hospital stay so that gives us the how many how long they held and so that's the entire hospital course that we can get that baby's held time so this is our demographic data so we looked at the baseline data so we looked at the baseline for the first skin to skin for 12 months so we had a 90 babies in that categories and so intervention was 6 months we started this project july july of 2019 and we ended in december 2019 is a 6 months time period was our intervention time period so we had a 32 babies and we wanted to look at this small less than 30 weeker and then more bigger than 30 weeker um, so so gestational age, we went as low as the lowest gestation was 24 and 3 weeker, and then intervention time was 27 and 6 weeker. And we are continuing analyzing this project by doing the sustainable period for a one year. So it started in January of 2020. So this is the ongoing data collection. We have the smallest baby in the sustainable period was 26 weeker. So this is the graph. So whenever we are looking at any quality improvement project, instead of showing the bar graph, it's a way of, way of showing, displaying our data in a different format. It's a control chart. So this one is the X chart. So there's a QI macro software. So I just use that to analyze our data. So the X axis, you have the different time period in a quarterly. And then Y axis, you have hours of life. So the, as you can see, the baseline, the middle line is the control limit. That's the average. So baseline was the average 42 hours. So we are actually doing pretty good with our baseline data too. So pretty much average, our babies held within 42 hours. But some of the babies, they were micropremies or so some reason they were not held in 48 hours time period. So it ranges from anywhere 300 to 500 hours of life. So that's the reason we wanted to narrow this upper control limit and lower control limit. We started this project. As you can see, the several interventions made during this time period. So as early mentioned, so we did all this, created the subcommittee, put, put the poster and standardized the transfer. So we were able to bring down this control limit down to nine hours during the intervention time period. So all the babies, they held within 48 hours. And so the control limit went down to nine hours. So then this starting January, so our control limit went up a little bit. It's a 28 hours because we had three micro preemies and they were an oscillator. So though we provided the containment hold, and since we are looking at the skin to skin, I, have, I didn't include that data. So the three babies, they were held outside the 48 hours window. So one was 50 hours, the other one was like 500 hours. So they were an oscillator. Um, so that's the reason. So we, we have this higher control limit of 28 hours and still doing great. And it's the way of looking at this entire baby population that actually tells us where we are and how we can improve our care. So then I wanted to look at this less than 30 weeker. So the 30 weekers first time skin to skin. So we had the baseline of 174 hours. They were the first skin to skin was done 174 hours of life. So which went down to 82 hours of life, which is significantly better compared to the baseline. And 30 to 35 weeker, the same 20 hours was the baseline average. And we were able to bring down to the 13 hours average. So when we have this arrow pointing down, that's our goal of bringing this control limit lower. So which is it's ongoing data collection. So hopefully we can bring this further down. So then the next aim was, as you, Eric, if you recall, the early mention is a 20% increase of out-of-the-box time. So we looked at the baseline data of six months. So we had 37 babies, less than 35 weeker, and then intervention period was six months and 29 um, babies in that category. So here is the control chart looking at the X chart and then X axis is the time and then Y axis is the minutes and average control limit is 89.5. So that's close to 90 hours the babies were held out of the box. 
when we emerged the baseline. So we were created 20 percent above that baseline was 110 minutes was our goal. So as you can see, our goal has improved significantly, increased to 156 hours, which is a 75% above our goal. So our goal was like 20%, and we were able to reach up to 75% increase of out-of-the-box minutes per day. So I wanted to look at this, what are, what are we doing with the skin to skin care alone, not including the swaddle hold. So the baseline data for the skin to skin was 47, 47 minutes per day average, the babies have been held skin to skin. So 20% above is a goal of 57 minutes. So as you can see, we are above this goal. So we were able to improve our minutes, the babies held skin to skin, which was 68 minutes but you can see still several babies they were spending below our goal so then when we are looking at the data so i noticed so because of the parental preference and so they wanted to do the swaddle hold when the babies are older and bigger so they make they wanted to treat this as a normal baby so they don't want it to do the skin to skin and so they prefer the swaddle hold that's the reason. So we are still seeing below this goal for individual babies, though the average is increased, but still below the goal. So what we achieved by doing this project? So all babies received a first skin to skin within 48 hours during intervention phase. And so during sustainability period, we have three babies not held within 48 hours. And I'm confident enough that we can, we can successfully overcome that this year. And our mean for initial skin to skin for less than 35 weeks, the baseline was 42, which decreased to nine hours, and during the sustainability period, 28 hours, which is a great success. And also, we achieved our goal of out of the box time, 75% increase, and skin to skin time, 45% increase overall. So this is our kangaroo care day, uh, the decoration in our unit. And I would just ask Arlene to talk about the barriers for implementing this project and uh, we'd be happy to take any questions after this uh, talk. Thank you. So when we looked at the barriers, of course, I think the barriers for our, yeah, most of the NICUs, including ours, is just the education of staff, how to go about that. Again, I was fortunate that I had skills day poster boards, a display board in your break rooms, bathrooms, tip sheets in bathrooms, YouTube videos. So if you're training on how to do transfer, you can find all kinds of YouTube videos on that. Swaddle baths, there's a lot of videos that have been made by NICUs around the country that you can pull from YouTube. Um, and then handouts, putting information in people's boxes that are updating. And, and it's, I find that if you do it monthly, that you get the buy-in a little bit better because as you start seeing more improvement and then they get a new tip of why we're doing it, it just excites them and they want to do it more and more, offer it more and more. The time lag of creating your flow sheet can be a barrier if you're trying to track it. And I, if that's not a possibility, I'm, in a few minutes, I'm going to show, show you my resources. So get your cameras ready because I'll hold up a little sheet that you guys can take a picture of that has some of the resources that I use. But one of the resources had a way that you could manually track it. And we do have some things that we're manually tracking in our unit for family center care. And so a couple of our night nurses track it for us at night. So it's another way to do it. Um, again, getting information, new information out can be a barrier as far as the documentation. Uh, it's common as for nurses just to say, I'm already doing so much, I don't have time to chart it you. But once you, if you can organize it in a way that it's one-stop shopping, I think once we had the family center care flow sheet and everybody opens it up and you just can go through that whole thing, it helps the charting take off. We also put a little cute reminder on the computers, just this little baby coming out of the box and said, did you chart your out of the box data today? And then I think a barrier that we all have and we will always have is just breaking our traditional beliefs. I have been a NICU nurse for 30 years and I was bought in that you don't disrupt a baby during their feeding cycle. If they're sleeping, let them sleep. And one of the things I just say to nurses is like, if your baby was at home and grandma had just walked in the door and they're swaddled in their blanket, wouldn't you pick them up to hand them to grandma for grandma to hold? Just trying to break those beliefs. Ways that you can do that is your champions. Um, if I see a family come in sitting at the bedside and it's not my assignment, it doesn't mean I can't offer to get that baby out. So I'll just say, hey, Kathy, I see your family sitting at the bedside. Can I get the baby out to hold until feeding time? 
We swaddle our babies in the isolate, so that way it's easy to get the babies out. Rather than using the positioning aids, we've gone to swaddling as soon as we can. Another way I do it is when I have families in my assignment, I will teach them to become independent, get their own babies out of the crib, get their own babies out of the isolate. Yes, we do. Had a lot of pushback with that, with nurses saying they can't get babies out of isolate. And we allow, we allow that. We're not going to change. If that nurse feels safe getting the baby out themselves. But it's funny how it's taken off as they start seeing more parents become independent. And in reality, we're going to need that when we go to the private rooms because I won't be in the room all the time when the parents are in there. Just giving the, the parents the autonomy and the, the reason why we want the baby held. I talk to them a lot about the baby was getting all the senses when they were inside of you. They were getting touch, smell, taste, hearing, movement. And in the box, they're not getting any of that. So get them out, hold them, offer them those senses, and that will help with brain development. And then just having, again, those tips. So when I weaknesses or things that aren't working, that's what I'll focus my teaching and my tip sheet on for the month for the families. Ongoing work. Uh, one of the things you could see, we're still struggling a little bit with the micro preemies. So I found out that UC Davis actually holds infants on uh, high frequency ventilators. I've gotten some pictures. So that's one of the projects I want to work on this next year is working on transferring a baby that's on a high, uh, on a high frequency ventilator. Improving our documentation again, just those reminders and rewarding the nurses for documentation and for holding babies. So we, I established like a Starbucks gift card. And so Malthy was able to track some of my data for me so I could see which nurses were actually in the beginning documenting the most and holding the most. So I would give, give certificates to those staff and I would advertise that in the unit that I had just given that gift certificate to them. At one point I noticed that the babies that were bottle fed were getting extended hold. So they were being held longer than their bottle feeding. And so typically they would be held with their bottle and their gavage feeding by the nurses, but the gavage baby only were not being pulled out. So then I started giving gift certificate or Starbucks cards to those nurses that were, had the highest percentage of holding infants during gavage feeds. And then I caveat that and I just remind nurses that there is days that you have that assignment that you can't hold the babies and it's totally understandable. But there is days that we can't hold our infants and that we may need to make that a priority. And I, it's neat to see that when I walk through the unit, sometimes I'll just see Maggie, who's on today. I'll walk by and she's got a baby on, in her hands and she's there at the computer documenting with her right hand and she's got the baby in her left hand. And then just looking at other ways to improve it, tying it, I thought about it when we talked about the reading program, is like tying it into other programs. Because with the reading program right now, I am noticing that when I walk through the unit, there's nurses that are sitting there reading to the babies, but the baby's still in the crib. So maybe that will be one of the focuses I put up this next month or so is that let's pick up the baby and read to them. And then maybe, and then working on trying to provide positive contact during painful procedures is some ongoing work we'd like to expand to. Let me, the take home messages are pretty much, we've gone through all of those. What I want to do is if you can make me, Kathy, the big screen, I just want to pop this up. The one thing I can just say is if you just Google the kangaroo challenge, Sunnybrook Hospital, they actually have a kit. They do a challenge every May from January 1st to the 15th, where they are trying to promote skin to skin in their unit and increase their time. And they've even had challenges with other hospitals, but they have a wonderful kit that you can download to your computer. And it has lots of valuable teaching information for staff, for family, for parents. I have to say most of my ideas came from that website. And then I had, there's the other, there's two other websites that also have some kits. Yeah, we'll send that out. And then on the bottom, I have just another article that talked about children up to age 20 and what the NICU environment does to them and ways that we need to start improving that. Yeah, we'll send that out. I'm sorry I didn't have it made in the slide. Oh, it's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> Fantastic. I love this presentation. I loved it when I saw it in Florida. I'm so happy that you were able to come and share it. And there have been lots and lots of questions. So it, do you want to just unmute yourself if you ask a question? If you don't feel comfortable or you're in a noisy place, I can read the questions as well. Anybody want to, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, sure. Susie, do you want me to unmute you? 
Oh, she's talking. She's not. Let's see. Let me find you. And I'm so thrilled to see this out of the box challenge and uh, program. It's just really wonderful. But I had a comment I would like to make about one of the barriers that was identified by Arlene, which was to break the belief that you shouldn't interrupt a baby who is sleeping because you'll disrupt the sleep cycles. And having a 60 minute sleep cycle is absolutely perfect because all of our EEG studies clearly showed the sleep cycle in our preemies and up to 52 weeks post-conceptional age is one hour long. And we have five publications under Ludington Ho and my grant that I got from NIH looking at sleep. And you have to remember that sleep in kangaroo care is 10 times better than sleep not in kangaroo care, better than swaddled sleep in the incubator. And we used a design of three hours from one feeding bef to the next before we put them in kangaroo care, then they had a feeding in kangaroo care and they had another three hours. And then we watched them again for three hours back in the incubator afterwards. And we followed this randomized control trial up with doing the kangaroo care this way from 36 to 40 weeks. And of course, all of our findings in over five publications showed that the sleep quality was much more superb than what you get anytime they're in a box. And in terms of, for example, discriminating state, you don't have an indiscriminate state when they're in kangaroo care. And that the quality of the EEG record during deep quiet sleep was fantastic. And the duration of it as well as the quality. We clearly showed in two other articles, brain maturation is much faster with the kangaroo care sleep. The complexity of the brain as it develops with kangaroo care sleep far exceeds that what uh, that occurs in any other type of sleep. And uh, not just complexity, but it was the, the uh, connectivity that we also examined that was so much better. And really, by the time the babies were 40 weeks, they had better brain development than any term infant. And that was a two week advanced brain maturation with just an hour and a half to three hours per day of kangaroo care for five days a week. And you'll find these under Ludington Ho and all of my colleagues as in pediatric neurology. And I wanted to really comment how thrilled I am to see that your out of the box quality improvement project is using the Schuhart charts with upper and lower control levels because this is a very fine way to be evaluating what is happening, especially with quality improvement project. And I was very pleased to see that and looking forward to the publication tremendously. They, it's such a wonderful idea. I learned so very much, but I'm hoping that we can get a copy of the slides and particularly of the references. One of the exciting things that just demonstrates the buy-in from the families. I have a 28 week primary kind of that I was assigned a lot the first month and I was talking a lot to the parents about skin to skin and they have another child at home and they're just trying to find time to come in and I said you can do them back to back you don't have to and literally I was then off for two weeks and I came back had the assignment and it was so funny because dad would come he came in for his feeding he held the whole three hours till the next feeding and then I said, okay, do you want me to get the baby back for mom? And he said, no, you, we started changing the baby's diaper on me. And then you'll hold the baby and put the baby on mom. And I was just like, I had a tear in my eye. Cause I, I was just like, okay, so we're holding for six hours. Oh, that's great. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's so exciting. Some of the other questions, if anybody's going to unmute, go for it. I'll just plow ahead with a few of them. Use Angela. So one of the barriers that we have is while we swaddle the babies inside the isolate because we track one of our like metrics for the year is skin to skin and one of the things that I think is our barrier is that we put clothes on the baby in the isolate how did that affect you guys and how did you get over that barrier because it's like oh I don't want to take off their outfit or because parents like having that kind of that bonding moment with dressing their baby in that normalcy 
So is there anything that you can suggest for that? What we just talk with the families is that I, our goal is to get them to come in at any time, not just feeding time. Usually they would come in feeding time for skin to skin. So come in anytime you're available here. And then if they walk in, it's in between, we'll pull them out swaddled. And then when it's feeding time, we put them back in the isolate, the parents undress them, do their vitals, do their diaper, get them ready for skin to skin. And then we bring them back out again for skin. We have both going on. Okay, so the swaddled while their feeding's going on, if they come in between. No, the swaddle is in between. So the feeding time is 9 o'clock, they came in at 8. Rather than sitting there at the bedside waiting till skin to skin, we get them out swaddled. And doesn't, so it doesn't, and we just get them out. Then parents hold rocks. That's when they do their reading. And and we'll, feeding time's 9 o'clock. Then we put them back in the isolate to do the skin to skin. Parents take their clothes off, that kind of thing. Great. Thank you so much. I thought it was a really great tip, Arlene, about the just swaddling more and that transition out of the positioning aids to make that easier to do. And just almost to prompt you, like you said, like if those opportunities come, how quick you could just do it. Yeah. Or the parents can become independent. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Everything swaddled in there. It's their little baby bundle. They can just grab them. Deanna, did you want to unmute? I see you there. Yeah, I think I just unmuted. So, hi everyone. I'm from the East Coast and I was just curious. We have some limitations in visitation now and I was wondering how this is impacting kangaroo care. If you were seeing some data changes with regards to that, it's really, it's actually, we have seen some decrease in breast milk because we're able to track that. We use an application for tracking all of our breast milk. And it would be great if we had one of these for kangaroo caring too, to be able to track it. But we definitely are concerned about this. Again, I live in Connecticut, definitely have some concerns about it. I was just wondering if you were seeing any impacts to the data. Okay, so for the data I have until March and it hasn't changed. Our visitation is still allowing both parents to be at the bedside. So they are still doing the kangaroo care. So we haven't changed our policies or family centered care and the leadership team. We still think it's the parents can come in and they are wearing the mask and we are allowing them. So our data didn't change. The next question I have is, for the tracking, I would love to hear what you're using for the tracking for the breast milk. So my other project is the improving the hand expression of colostrum. So we are getting that encouraging within an hour expressing their colostrum. So it's actually they are seeing increased breast milk production. So we just wanted to track that. So we have a different way of looking. So I would love to hear what you guys are doing for tracking their breast milk volume. Yeah, it's actually an interactive. The family, the mothers input the data on an application called Keratin, K-E-R-I-T-O-N. And we know exactly how much is in the system. We know how much they're pumping at different times. We're able to engage with them through the application with regards to pumping. So it's, it's a product. So I don't mean to market it or anything, but <laughs> we just went live with it a, a few months ago. So it has been really great to see kind of what it uh, uh, gives us as far as data is concerned. But I think it would be really great if we had something for kangaroo care, just so we had something more tangible that the families could engage with too, because they actually are a big piece of this, obviously. And I think it would be great if we had some way of of them being able to participate in some of this QI more actively. Yeah. So there is a baby, March of Dimes, a My Nikki baby, you guys are all familiar with that. There is a kangaroo care, so they can put the kangaroo care timing and they can track that on their end. But I don't think there is a way to transfer that information into electronic health record, but it's definitely that's a way. So that's how our parents are tracking the milk supply too, how much they are pumping and things like this. But I just wanted to have a system to transfer so we can look at the information. Thank you for sharing that. Great. Great. Janet, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself or Jackie, I see you're unmuted. Do you have a quick, do you have a question or a comment? I wanted to address, there was a question that came up about intraventricular hemorrhage. What are you doing with, during the high risk period for IVH? And I got word on Monday that I've just been funded for a new NIH grant where we are going to be looking at the measures of IVH, cerebral blood flow, blood volume, et cetera, and pressure changes from 
when the baby is in kangaroo care with his head turned to one side versus when the baby is in the incubator with his head turned to one side. And that's because our very preliminary data of two subjects that we did for the grant application showed that the chances of changes when the baby is in skin to skin, that is such a calming parasympathetic treatment for the baby that we probably will not be seeing a problem for IVH increase, et cetera, or concerns that really were changing blood flow. But that's one of the things that came out of the Gravens conference about five years ago. So I just wanted to let people know that the IVH work is, is going on. And we also have a grant that got funded on March 19th that is looking at the stress of diaper changes because we have perfected a way to do diaper change during kangaroo care so I don't have to take my babies out of kangaroo care and put them back for diaper changes. So it's diaper changes and all of their assessments being done off of the monitors basically other than the physical assessment. And we have three different positions in the incubator versus on kangaroo care diaper change. So we're just starting those studies and they will have data in two years. The diaper change one, we have one year of data collection ahead of us. That's so awesome. Thank you for sharing it. Absolutely. And I think Arlene, your group is already figuring this out, how to do this diaper change on dad. So you're, you'll get, you'll have some evidence to back it up that's like robust science in a couple of years. One of the, one of the things you guys have already perfected with your team that you've done is the, how to transfer these babies in that vulnerable period so that you're not saying we're hands off 72 hours, not touching, but that you're actually maintaining that that midline. So are you doing that with standing transfers as much as possible? Or, you know, how are you doing that? Because I, I know that you mentioned that you are. We haven't got to the standing transfer. Parent yeah, do their own transfer hasn't taken off in our unit like I was hoping it was. We did an education on that about a year ago. So we decided not to do it that way. We do it with mom sitting down. We little wrap and then we put the baby on its side so we just transfer him to his side with his breathing. Mm -hmm. And then if, he, if you have the baby facing the ventilator and away from the chair that mom is sitting in and transfer that way, and then the baby will rest on mom on its shoulder. So he's laying on its side. So you never move the baby once. So you rotate it in the bed, go to mom, and then there on mom, we keep the baby in that sideline position and then secure him in in that sideline position. And so they're just facing the ventilator and keeping their head midline. Great. So. A published procedure for a transfer was published in 2002 in Neonatal Network by Ludington Ho because I had a federal grant for doing kangaroo care with ventilated babies. And most recently, you'll see a step-by-step -step with wonderful pictures in Birth Defects Research Journal, the September 2019 issue. The whole journal is about kangaroo care with many outstanding articles in it. And there's one from nurses up in Canada that put together a step-by-step -step with pictures of transfer. But the 2002 article does identify sitting and standing transfers and the data and the step-by-step -step procedure that we ended up using in my federal grant. So that data is also out there. And if you want any studies about kangaroo care, I maintain for the World Health Organization, the Kangaroo Care Bibliography. And it's over 600 pages long now uh, from every study that's been done around the world that's sent to me and I put it on this bib. But for example, if you wanted to look up transfer word document, you just type in the navigation transfer and all the articles that are in, exist about how to do transfers would come up on the bibliography, which is annotated. And then you can go to the original source and get the journal. And I probably already have it saved electronically anyway. So that's available to everybody by just emailing susan.luddington at case.edu, the KC bib. All this information, all these studies, and believe me, the, all of this about out of the box is going to go in there too today. <laughs> Some of the barriers were nurses afraid to do it because they didn't feel that the RTs had a different technique about how we were going to secure the tube during the transfer. And so I think that working with the RTs was probably the biggest piece because now with a standardized way that we want all of our to hold the tube, 
So one finger on the tube, one finger on the neobar as we go. And that made it more comfortable for everybody because that you could trust your RT because the biggest fear is extubation during the transfers. Yeah, absolutely. Jackie. First of all, with our transfers, RTs are mandatorily with us. In our small baby unit, it's a group effort. Babies are transferred without being disconnected from the ventilator all the time with a standing transfer. Sidelining until they're over their 72 hours. And then, and of course the parent does the actual lifting, leaning over. So that's been pretty successful. We're most successful in our kangaroo minutes in our small babies, not so much in our larger babies. It's interesting. And the way we are tracking that there is in our Cerner charting system, they chart their position and your choices are being held or kangaroo or whatever, and it's tracked by minutes. And then twice a day, a task is fired for the nurse to qualify why the baby didn't get held or so that's being tracked. Now I'm not saying our numbers are great, but we do have some things in place that we could improve on with the tracking system. So do you think that you're finding what the El Camino group has found, which is just at they get to a certain age, it's more of the swaddle holding and you were tracking just the skin to skin holding? Actually, we could, we track whether they're being held also. Okay. But we find parents, once babies can be swaddled or once babies are able to have that for thermal regulation or whatever, they really want to treat the baby like they're bigger and older, it's an accomplishment for them. And they want to see their faces. I think they really want to do that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the same with our bubble seat. We see the faces with our baby. Yeah. 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 So how are you guys overcoming <clears throat> the ooey gooey 23, 24, 20, 25 weekers who are in all that humidity and I can, shouldn't say ooey, but they're the gooey babies. <laughs> There's a wonderful new study that'll be out by Niels Bergman in about two months. It was just talking to him. And that's the one that was by, funded by the Bill Gates Foundation, where they have started taking all babies, including 22, 23 weekers, putting them right into kangaroo care within one hour of delivery. Right. And the results are quite phenomenal. They've been doing the study in four international sites for these micro preemie research is what we call it, the micro preemie. Yeah. The results are very astounding and absolutely wonderful that really show that the place of care should really be the skin to skin contact as it is in Sweden where the incubators are up at the ceiling and the mothers are lying on beds that accommodate queen size beds that accommodate their partner and the baby stay on the mother's chest until she needs to get up and go to the bathroom or visit somebody else, one of her children who comes to visit, in which case she pushes a button and the incubator comes down from the ceiling. She wow. puts the baby in the incubator. She goes out to the bathroom, has lunch, and when she comes back, Baby goes right back on her chest as place of care because it changes everything and gets these babies home so much sooner. And then this, she sends it back up to the ceiling. And they've been doing that even in our 2010 report, which was cited, which came from our International Network of Cancer Mother Care. The babies, all babies there at Uppsala Hospital are, within, are in 24-7 kangaroo care within a week of life of birth within a week of birth so that is working exceptionally well for them and it's a certainly a philosophy that i was hoping family integrated care would be able to implement but if you read the birth defects research journal article by linda frank she says it seems quite impossible for us to get 24 7 kangaroo mother care going in the united states and canada though vancouver hospital is having a wonderful success rate with it and there's also an article in that same issue of birth defects research about how well it's working there wow. Alfie or arlene what about these babies in high humidity that feel slippery and people are nervous about everything I think the hard part is we haven't had a lot of them yet in the unit, so we've had three, but the buy-in was good. We only, the hard part we had, they went on the high frequency. I think one of them got held before and that thing, but I used, luckily we have the sister hospital, San Francisco, 
and they had lots of micro preemies. So kind of where I got the comfort level with our MD team and our nurses, they were successfully doing that. The babies weren't getting cold. We limited it to an hour right now per our head neonatologist. The other units aren't limiting the time that the babies are doing same warm and all those kind of things. But I can't say we can say a lot about it because we just don't have enough of them yet to see what our buy-in is going to be and how well we're going to do with that. Yeah, I agree with Darlene. Yeah, that's where we are finding it. So we limited to one hour, but I think it's just a matter of everybody be comfortable. So we haven't seen many 23-week here. Yeah. So that's why we don't see there. And then we go into this gentle ventilation of awesome <laughs> So I want to hear if any other unit they are doing the kangaroo care or if Susan has any data about a kangaroo care in an oscillator. So I would love to hear from her and share any thoughts or using oscillator. I can speak from our experience at Loma Linda when I was there even years ago and we had to advocate for the more flexible circuits for high frequency, but we routinely did it. And then it's been a decade since I left there. But I think it's exactly what you've done is A, you found other places that are doing it. You can connect those resources together, RT to RT sometimes, being able to speak and talk about that. I know Jane Solomon's on the phone or on the line and her RT, Amanda, has come to several of our one conferences and been one of our RT champions. And she was very integral in their program there. And she's a fantastic resource from Florida to talk to other RTs as well about what they're doing in their programs. So sometimes that networking, I think, is really nice and effective because they can speak their language, right? They, they know each other. They know those, the products that are out there in that space really well. What we did at Loma Linda, which I've shared with many of you over the years for standing transfer to get people over that, was we used a baby doll. So we created a mock-up of an incubator, a sick baby with all the tubings, and we would actually have staff like you did. But we'd also take the families out and share with them an opportunity to say, we're going to practice this thing called the standing transfer. And what here are the benefits of that. And we would let them practice on the doll and just that whole idea of leaning in and picking up, being able to then see how the whole setup looked like. They found it to be so helpful. And our PT, Gerta, at that time, she was just the champion of that. And it made such a difference to the parents to have that kind of simulation, just like for us to have simulation. We gave that to the parents and that really helped us to get over the hurdle of that. So I'll offer that suggestion just as something that might work. Um, and certainly it did work for us when we were doing that. Thank you. Thank everybody for teaching me so very much today. I, it was a fascinating meeting, and thank you very much. And let me hear from you and send you whatever articles you want. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you so thank, much. Thank you. And I'll just say thank you again to, to both of you for being with us. It stimulated so much good conversation and just beyond grateful for the work you're doing, for the babies, and for everything. And enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Bye. Thanks, Kathy. You're welcome. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thanks again for being a part of our Monday live stream series here at Synapse Care Solutions. If you would like to grab the slides or any of the other resources that we mentioned in this presentation, go ahead and just scan the QR code on the screen or in the show notes below after the replay, it should be available as well. We have several other live streams. So if you um, would like to know about those, subscribe to our channel, hit the like button so that YouTube knows to send more of these your way and hit the notification bell so that you can be notified of any of our upcoming events. Thanks for being a part of our Synapse Care live stream series. I will see you next week.